In my last video, I briefly mentioned that I recorded all the footage at 16 frames per second, but if you've seen the video, you'd know it's definitely not 16 frames per second. The truth is, is that every other frame in that video was never recorded. They were generated by Dane, a depth-aware AI frame interpolation algorithm. What makes the program unique is the depth awareness. What this means is that, in theory, if I move my hand over a background, it will interpolate my hand separately from the background instead of being dumb and interpolating the background around my fingers. I had originally shot the Canon RAW video with frame interpolation in mind. There's only so much data the camera can record at once. You either have to sacrifice resolution, bit depth, or frame rate. I chose frame rate with the hopes of regaining those frames with optical flow. Under certain circumstances, optical flow works well, but using it for a whole 4 minute video was bound to run into issues. Pretty much any scene with my hands in them were a warped mess. I lucked out though and discovered Dane. When using Dane, there's a few settings to consider. Don't interpolate scene changes is important. I set the detection sensitivity to 20 for my Canon RAW video. Before I started actually using the program, I was actually worried about just that. Wondering if I'd have to run each clip individually, then put them together after so the scene changes don't morph into each other. There's actually an effect that uses frame interpolation to morph two images together, but adding depth awareness doesn't really make that big of a difference for a scene change. Depending on the resolution and the amount of VRAM your video card has, Dane probably won't be able to load the whole frames into VRAM. To get by this, there's a setting that splits the frames into smaller sections. There's also section padding that helps with objects moving across the splits, but it can also cause artifacts. I'm using a 1660 Super, which has 6 gigabytes of VRAM. It's able to load section sizes of around 350 to 400. I haven't messed around much with this and the padding size. The only thing I did was decrease the section size until the out of memory error stopped. Even the beefiest video cards out today, like 1080 Ti's and 2080 Ti's, only have 11 gigabytes of VRAM. Even those cards can't load entire 1080p frames. The benefit of the split frames are that you can actually use the program, but the downsides are the video is more susceptible to artifacts and is less efficient. Currently, the app requires CUDA to run, so is limited to NVIDIA cards, but if in the future the app gains support for AMD cards, things get interesting. It'd be possible to purchase a few 8GB RX 570s and run them in Crossfire for a combined 16 or 24 gigs of VRAM. With 24 gigs of VRAM, you'd be over the 18GB amount required to load 1080p frames. By doing that though, it would resolve the artifacts and increase efficiency speeding up the render times. You could also do the same thing with NVIDIA, but their graphics cards still cost much more for a comparable amount of VRAM. AMD cards also seem like they have more computational power though. In the crypto mining boom, AMD cards were highly valued because they had more power and could achieve a higher hash rate. In terms of raw power, AMD cards win, but I'm not sure how well that would transfer over to the Diane app like if being in CUDA creates some sort of efficiency or optimization. With a higher amount of VRAM, it might be tempting to go for higher and higher resolutions, but it also begins taking longer and longer to render the frames. Anything more than 1080p would take ages to render. My Canon RAW video was in 1664 by 708. Granted, that's an ultra-wide aspect ratio and around 400 pixels wider than normal 720p, it's still pretty low resolution and it took 32 and a half hours to render the 4 minute 35 second video. Doing the math real quick, at 16 frames per second, that's 4810 frames. I set the interpolation to 2x doubling the frame rate, giving me 32 FPS footage, which means one frame is generated in between each of the original frames. So 4810 frames were created, minus a few from skipping scene changes. It made about 2.5 frames a minute. That's agonizingly slow, but it's definitely doable. You just have to finish the project three days before your deadline and run the renders overnight so your PC is still usable in the waking hours. But of course, as the frame rate increases, length of the video increases, and resolution of it, the amount of time to render also increases. Overall, the quality of the footage is pretty good. There's still some weird things with my hands going on, but only when they move quickly. If you move too quickly, it doesn't interpolate properly and 
just fades the object out and then in. If you're looking for faults, you can find them every once in a while, but as long as you're not analyzing the footage looking for these things, they can be pretty easy to miss. Bringing up the issue with artifacts kind of looks like old film that's been damaged or has gunk on it. As far as I know, these are from the frames being split apart and then being stitched back together. When they're stitched back, they result in weird artifacts. Occasionally, you can actually make out where the stitch happened in a few places. Again, no way to solve this without more VRAM or using a low enough resolution to load the entire thing at once. Using this on Magic Lantern video is almost perfect, but the amount of time it takes to render these things can be hard to swallow. Unless you're doing something like downscaling anime to run it through Dane and then upscale it, which anime is one of the few things that can be upscaled very well, it's a very niche tool. But there are some legitimate use cases for this, like old video and stop motion. So does this magically turn things into slow motion video? Well, it's not going to magically create accurate data of what's happening in the image. If there aren't enough frames that define what's happening in the scene, like with some of this footage where you don't see the drops of water splitting apart, or with this bird flying by, then it's just going to morph or fade the objects in and then out of the frames. You can pretty much use optical flow as an early indicator of what will happen in Dane. I find in order to get a good render, you can't exceed a certain threshold of movement. If there's too much movement in a scene where something is moving around too much, nothing will save it. But what makes this special is the depth awareness. The movement limitations apply to any kind of frame rate interpolation. The depth awareness is the difference between this and this. If you're wanting to turn a few clips into something more cinematic, I'd say give it a go. It can't hurt to try, but I wouldn't rely on this to give you amazing slow motion. If the objects are doing a weird fade in and fade out with optical flow, then Dane will probably do the same thing. I would first try optical flow and see how well that works. It's much quicker and a lot of scenes in my computer build would have looked totally fine if I used optical flow instead of Dane, which could have saved several hours of render time. Regardless, there's still some things that you have to take into consideration when filming footage that you're going to slow down, like motion blur. This only applies if you're slowing it down and not just making it smoother with more frames. If there's some clips you want to try and use frame interpolation with, shoot at higher shutter speeds. A general rule of thumb for natural motion blur is to set the shutter speed to double your frame rate. Higher shutter speeds make the footage look unnatural without motion blur, but it's something you can add back in later. If your clips have motion blur in them, then slowing them down will increase the perceived amount of motion blur. You can't remove it and it makes the footage look bad. So there's actually several clips where optical flow results actually look better than Dane's. Dane and this clip kind of have a rubber band effect on the holes entering the scene. Optical Flow, on the other hand, handles it very well. Optical Flow actually had the same issues initially, but setting the motion estimate to enhanced better resulted in the better footage. There's also times where Dane just fails. I'm actually going to start considering using optical flow a lot more for my b-roll footage. These clips slowed down really well. Imagine how much time I could save by slowing down fast clips instead of recording slow clips. Now if there's ever a time when I have something a little more tricky, like something with depth, Dane works well to separate those two. Most times. It still fails with some things, so it would be a good idea to take the most complicated part, or what you would think is the hardest part to interpolate, send it into Dane to see the results of the 7 frame clip in 10 minutes before sending an entire clip to render for 4 hours, and then having it end up being pretty much unusable. 
In theory, we could even run the same footage through the program several times to get super slow motion footage. But if the interpolated frames are bad, it will continue reiterating on those defects. So it's important to get the first ones right. If you get good results slowing it down 2x, then it will probably scale very well to 4x, 8x, and even more. So there's a few things I would redo about the computer build video. Namely, export it as something not so compression heavy as H.264, so it isn't heavily compressed twice. That may have degraded the footage quite a bit. I noticed in a few scenes some color banding. I'm not exactly sure what caused it, but I feel like since I went to such a great length to record the footage in RAW, that it shouldn't have been ruined by being encoded twice. Optical Flow has the benefit of being built into most video editors. It's a few simple clicks to enable it, whereas Dane is a program in and of itself. It would be very difficult and unlikely to be implemented into any other software anytime soon. It's just too resource heavy. But it's a useful tool, and it's a tool I'll be keeping in my belt for future use. And as the algorithm gets more training data, it'll get better over time. The app is only in alpha, so who knows how much progress will be made before the final versions. 